often to make the trip to get the answer to some of these cosmic questions. I'm joined by broadcaster Dallas Campbell, who's just written a book, Ad Astra, about humans' quest to get to the stars. Dallas, thank you for coming in. It's my greatest pleasure. Amazing timing, the 60th anniversary of Sputnik going into space. I'd like to say I wrote my book to coincide <laughs> perfectly with the 60th anniversary, but I didn't. It's a complete coincidence. In fact, I forgot until a couple so of days no ago. So no scientific precision in the writing of well, this? Well, a little bit in the book, but, but, but yeah, exactly. It's one of those fortuitous things. Now, the interesting thing is, we're in a sense, six, going back 60 years, we are back where we started in many ways, back at that same launch pad, sending astronauts into space at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Yeah. Pretty much that Pretty Soyuz mu aircraft, that <laughs> rocket has... Yeah. has, has not modified? How much would well, you say it's modified over the years? A little bit. I mean, you say, I mean, we've come a long way in lots of other ways. I mean, thinking about Sputnik, which is our first artificial moon, and if you think about how much stuff is out there now circling the Earth in terms of the satellites, communication satellites that rule the world, govern our world, and life on Earth. But in terms, you're right, in terms of human spaceflight, that Sputnik launch in 19, uh, 1957 was such a seminal moment and it was took place in what is now Kazakhstan at the Baikonur Cosmodrome and that rocket was the R7 it was the first intercontinental ballistic missile and the design of that was to lob a, a nuclear weapon a nuclear warhead onto America and they also realized well actually we can we can chuck up, chuck up a, a satellite and a dog and a, and a human being as well if we want to but if you want to go into space today the only way the only bus stop to space is there, is at the, at the Cosmodrome, on that very same launch pad that Sputnik was launched and Laika and Yuri Gagarin and Tereshkova. That's it. We're st and we're still using the same rocket, pretty much. So the Soyuz uh, is pretty much the same. It's a variant of the R7. But if you look at it, they're almost identical. The Soyuz is a bit longer and, and bits and bobs. But the actual muscle itself is the same thing. And that is where you start your book. Yes. When uh, Yuri Gagarin, 1961 was the year he went to yes. space. And you say there at the Baikonur Cosmodrome, much has remained the same. Even the music that the astronauts listen to <laughs> before they get on board the Soyuz, we can hear a little bit a little of it bit, now. Yeah. Zemlyanye, uh, the band called Earthlings, yes. and they, this is the tune that, it's superstitious, that they have to listen to this as one of the rituals they do before they board. Correct. All there's this long, the Russians particularly are so su superstitious, and everything that Gagarin did, the, the cosmonauts and the astronauts who fly on Soyuz now do as well. I mean, this band is, you know, not, not from back then, but, it's, but this is the song they all listen to before they board the spacecraft. And I think there are a few other rituals. I think we can listen to that music. Do we have the music? Yeah. There we go. This is... If you're preparing to board yes. a Soyuz to go to the ISS yes. now, you will still have to go through these rituals you do. There's in that a, place. There's a whole lot of rituals. There's the signing of the door. There's a film they have to watch. All astronauts and cosmonauts have to watch this particular uh, Russian film, which they all watched with their families the night before. And as they come out the hotel, I was there for, for Tim Peake's launch at Baikonur. And as they come out the hotel ready to get on the bus to go to the, to, to get suited up, that particular song is playing and actually it's really the lyric I, in, in the book I actually have the lyrics written down translated and it's all about missing the earth and the, and the, the green green grass of home and all, all these kind of wonderful things and yeah and uh, actually the other famous ritual they do when they get on the bus to the launch pad all the astronauts have to get out and they have to do a pee against the back right hand tire of the bus because that's what Gagarin did <laughs> and if it was good enough for Yuri it's good enough for the astronauts today and in terms of what people must provide in qualities, human qualities, <laughs> yeah. to be an astronaut nowadays. How has it changed? That's what you go into a lot in your book. What do people need yeah. to go through the checklist of, of things they need to have done or qualities they need to have to be considered to be an astronaut? Well, this is the thing. When writing the book, I, I tragically realized I would be the worst astronaut <laughs> ever. I'd be so bad. But back in the day, the 1950s and the 1960s, when we were first sending people up into space, we didn't know what an astronaut was. What are the roles of an astronaut? And really, it was the first thing was to survive. And then it was to be able to operate machinery, to operate the spacecraft. But now, of course, the roles have broadened so much. You know, we go up into space now to do science. We're up on the ISS doing scientific research. If we're going to be going to Mars, we're going to be going for a long time. So it's not just about being a, a test pilot. You've got to have the character. You've got to be the kind of person you'd, you'd want to go camping with for six months and not be driven crazy by. So astronauts, if you meet them now, there is, they're all individuals. But there is this thread 
that runs through them. They are these superhumans. They're all extraordinarily nice, like the nicest people you've ever met, as well as being utterly brilliant. And you've said you've never met an unpleasant astronaut. I've never met one I haven't liked. But I haven't met them all, so maybe there is one I wouldn't like. Maybe but, there's but, one out there. But, I mean, for example, in the book I talked to Al Warden, and Al's actually in the UK at the moment, and we've been doing some talks. Al was the command module pilot for Apollo 15. So he's one of 24 people, only 24 people wow. in the entire human race who's been to the moon. And, you know, he's, uh, he's still around and, and, and talking to kids and getting them excited about STEM subjects and trying to inspire them. But when you talk to Al, you know, he's a movie star. He's a rock star. You can't not listen to him. He's so engaging. He's still so passionate about life and about the universe and about, you know, engaging people with his subject. It's great. Now, I think it's something like 553 people have actually gone into space That's out of what, 108 That's billion people that have yes. ever lived. Yes. If there are yeah. people, future astronauts, would-be astronauts out there watching you and thinking, do I have the right qualities, what would you say were the absolute essentials? <sighs> the absolute, well, I mean, I'm going to say, the thing is, being an astronaut, it's difficult because it's all about timing because they're not always hiring astronauts. So it's about being in the right place at the right time obviously. So all you can do with that level of uncertainty is prepare for the unknown as, as much as you can. And unfortunately, it is really the boring stuff, like do good at school, study things you like. But also, don't th if you actually want to be an astronaut, don't make being an astronaut as your primary goal. Make being in love with life as your primary goal. Be interested in the world, be interested in people, be interested in science. And if you do those things because you genuinely love them, and do these subjects because you genuinely love them. Maybe the planets will align and the stars will come out and they, you know, your nation, wherever you live, might just be hiring an astronaut and, and you might have just set yourself up at the right place at the right time. So that's my advice. Or be very, very rich. That's the other. You know, be a multi being, being, the head of a, being head of Amazon helps, for example. Uh, ten seconds. I mean, okay. is it easier to get into space nowadays than it was? I mean, is it more accessible? Is it softer skills rather uh, than harder skills? Uh, yes, and it's going to get more accessible as well. I think you, you, we've all heard of Virgin Galactic and space tourism. That will happen. It's not going to be big orbital space, but we are going to be going back to the moon. We are going to be going to Mars. That's exciting. They're going to need astronauts. Dallas, thank you very much. Thank Dallas Cadwell and your book Ad Astra is out now. Stay with us here on BBC World News still to come. It's been labelled as a global